Hi everyone, it's Sean from Pulse Markets here today. We've got um, John Manusu and Professor, yes, I said Professor Harina here with us today. Um, we're giving you an update with what's happening with Agros, and there's been some very, very, very exciting developments uh, in the recent or last week with what's happened um, internally and externally at Agros, which we're going to hear about today. We've also got some updates uh, to quite a few questions that investors have had as to how the trials are going, how the business is performing, where we see things going. So what we've got for you today are a bunch of questions, which Agros has so graciously uh, given us their time to answer in this busy period of their lives. Uh, but firstly, what I'd like to do is uh, to welcome John and Hari. Welcome. Thanks, Sean. Pleasure Thanks, to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, what we might do is we've got some very big news, but we might just lead up to it. Uh, and we've got some other questions which we'll get into. But uh, one thing that's been on everyone's lips is uh, the with COVID, everyone's had delays, no matter what business you're in. And um, the clinical trials have not escaped that, but for a different reason. Uh, can you give us an update on the clinical trials and how that's going, please? Let me, uh, let me first uh, start uh, by saying that we don't look at these things as delays. What they are uh, is us making sure that we are thoroughly prepared to go into a clinical trial with a uh, infusion or a drug that is very safe. Uh, we do not want to do what CSL did, which is to you know have gone into a clinical trial and then have to reassess how the clinical trial was engineered uh, or you know how or when uh, dosage should have taken place. As far as Agros is concerned, our mantra is it's uh, patients first through innovation, but safety first. And that safety first is, is something that uh, we have both pushed as far as our employees are concerned. The question that I ask the employees on any day is, are you sure that you will give this particular drug to your partner, your wife, your husband, your children, your, your mother, your father, your brothers and sisters and friends. And if your answer is even a slight no, we will not do it. So I think that that is where we are. As, as far as the clinical trial is concerned, all of you know that we've uh, completed the first time of the clinical trial. We are undergoing the analysis of the results and you know we will go into some of that in a little while. But let me tell you, the results really point to a situation where uh, the, the word de-risk is a good word to use because we know that when we give the hyperimmune to a patient, what we're going to be seeing is exactly what we expect, which is an increase in the antibodies in the patient. Okay, Hari, uh, that's fantastic. Now, from what I've heard or what I've read recently, it's not only agros, and which is the key thing I'm about to say, that are actually stating this. Uh, can you give us some information on what has happened in the last week that not only you, but some very independent bodies have actually said about Agros and your technology and Covimune. We we have always said that we uh, are working with the Kirby Institute. The Kirby Institute is Australia's premier health institute associated with the University of New South Wales. And in fact, you may have heard about the Kirby in a lot of newspaper articles recently, but they have been in the forefront at mm. looking at the COVID antibody uh, vaccine treatments and all sorts of other aspects of learning about COVID. So in the recent few weeks, we have been working with the Kirby in analyzing uh, the COVID immune that we are preparing or manufacturing. Uh, in recent studies, it has become very clear that whilst convalescent plasma, that is plasma from recovering patients, do uh, the, the antibodies do work? They only work in a very uh, limited sort of way, and sometimes do not have a neutralizing capacity for the older uh, viruses, the, the uh, 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 Wuhan, Delta, etc. They, they have some effect with Wuhan and Delta, but not in the latest uh, 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 mutations. So things like the Omicron virus, no effect whatsoever. In contrast to that, our cobimmune actually shows a very significant reaction to these antibodies, uh, to neutralizing antibodies or the effect of neutralizing COVID uh, uh, when you look at them uh, in a laboratory. Now, what it shows is something that John and I have been talking about repeatedly 
And that is that our product automatically updates because what you're doing is that you're collecting the plasma from patients who have currently recovered from the mutation that is the mutation in place. So currently you're looking at BA.5 and that is the sort of antibodies that we get. Uh, the, the, the most exciting part of this is how uh, effective our COVID immune is in neutralizing the COVID antibody compared to convalescent plasma. The other aspect of this is, of course, that we've had 15 monoclonal antibodies that have been approved by the TGA. 14 of those do not seem to have any effect with the latest mutations. And yet, there's one, uh, Abishield, which has some effect. So in using this particular strategy and using our Cobamune, we strongly, strongly believe, because of the results that are coming out from Kirby and from us, that the uh, effect of our Cobamune is to neutralize the antibodies for the mutation that is uh, present in the current form. So that is, in fact, a very significant finding. Did they say this in a public forum with yourselves, like they, they've endorsed this? They've said that this is happening. Well, I think that, uh, you know, Sean, uh, that uh, we have actually presented this at the Australian Society for Immunology and Clinical Allergies in Melbourne as recently as last week. Uh, and therefore, this particular publication or poster was together with Kirby. Tonight at 6.30 p.m., we have a presentation of our poster at the Blood 22 conference in Sydney. So these are published abstracts and presented posters. So this is in the public arena, and uh, we expect to get a lot of interest from many organizations, including the NBA and Lifeblood. Thank you, Hari. That's fantastic. Just tidying up on these clinical trials, is it true that you've done 15 stability studies, which the TGA needs to look at, and each stability study has been exactly the same? We have done numerous stability trials Manufacturing is a situation where we have to follow TJ regulatory guidelines. And the guidelines include a number of things, including us ensuring that there, there are no pathogens, there are no, the bio burden is low. You wouldn't believe the number of tests that we've got to do. On top of that stability, the reality of the situation is that when you give the first patient a antibody, you must be able to give the last patient in that group that same antibody. And in order to do that, you've got to make sure that the, the protein that you've purified is in fact stable, doesn't undergo uh, degradation, et cetera. Uh, we will continue to do those trials whilst we are also manufacturing the clinical batch itself to ensure that we've got continuing data that's coming in and to ensure that what is given to the patient, as I said, right at the beginning of, of, of this presentation, that the product that we give is in fact safe. Mm. And that is all that we will look at. And that is the only time that we will actually agree to the start of the clinical trial when we know, when I can sign off on a piece of paper saying that the product is safe. That's fantastic. So all this information goes to the TGA, which just to put things in context, the TGA actually gets a lot of information from the Kirby Institute. So the fact that the Kirby Institute's endorsing the clinical results you're getting in your trials bodes very, very well for a successful outcome of the clinical trial, would you not say? Uh, the Kirby Institute does a lot of other work uh, with the TGA. The, T the Kirby Institute is the go-to institution. The fact that we're working with the Kirby Institute gives us most definitely a validation of what it is that we are doing uh, but at the same time, what we are, try, uh, we, we are also doing is to, uh, to de-risk the second part of the clinical trial. What I'm saying uh, about this is that uh, when you normally talk about a clinical trial, you're looking at an endpoint. So I, if I can cure AIDS, that's the endpoint of a clinical trial. If I can cure uh, COVID, that's the endpoint of the clinical trial. In our case, we're looking at the antibody levels when you infuse a patient with the, the, the drug that we're talking about. Now, in the convalescent arm of the clinical trial, you saw, we saw that the antibody levels went up. Now, and, uh, hyperimmunes are used all the time. Uh, Anti-rabies, anti-tetanus, anti-D. Uh, th these are the sort of uh, hyperimmunes that are used in clinical medicine. In terms of the actual protein that we're infusing, it's an immunoglobulin, it's a hyperimmune. Uh, hyper all we're looking at is whether the concentration will go up. 
Now, because of the first time of the clinical trial, and because of the fact that we've now got information about the neutralizing ability of this clinical trial, the, the, there is very little doubt in my mind about the safety of the clinical trial and the success of the clinical trial. What we want to ensure is that like any registration for any new drug, you want to be able to get the information so that you can give the TGA uh, the information for them to say, all right, this is a safe drug. It is ready for registration. Yeah, I think the other thing to pick up on that is um, CSL and the Alliance went and did a, um, shall we say, rapid attempt to get a hyperimmune approved for COVID and they were unsuccessful. And as uh, as was the information coming out from CSL, they believed that was because, to quote the, uh, the managing director, they threw everything, including the pit kitchen sink, at that project. And as a result, they could not determine what was the outcome due to the hyperimmune versus anything else. And that's why they didn't proceed. So we're not going to make that mistake. We are going to be built some braces and make sure that we are answers to everything before we actually press the button on this. But there's one other point I think we should make here, Sean, and that is that the Kirby is a group that we've been working with for some time. In fact, there was a grant that was transferred from CSL that Kirby were working on to Agros, and that is the grant that we are still working with the Kirby Institute on, and that looks at some of the other variants that and, and the uh, neutralizing antibodies associated with that in COVID. So it shows that we are seen in the Australian market as the go-to organization in this area. Congratulations. And as I said, I don't think the Kirby Institute will be doing a paper with the likes of Agros if they weren't confident on the results that you were getting. There's no question about that. I mean, you would not get the Kirby mentioned in a collaborative paper with any organization if they yeah. didn't feel that the results were uh, true, significant, and focused on what, it, what the study is. I know when we've been dealing with several large brokers, some large fund managers, independent verification, apart from yourselves, was the most important thing. And I mean, I'm so excited to say that we now have that with an Australian body, which is recognised by the TGA, which is OSC Supreme, uh, to an overseas body. It, it's exactly what we're after when you're doing a TGA trial. Like, congratulations again. And, and I think also on that point, because uh, I suppose this is something that's been a bit of a rub for both Harry and myself, the TGA also has given us the GMP approval, and that is no easy obtain. That is a very high bar. And it says that you have two things going for you. One, that your process is reproducible and will make a therapeutic product at the appropriate level. And B, that the process you're using for this specific product is also approved, subject to doing the clinical trial. Um, and that also says that it is within the guidelines, the pharmacopoeia for that particular product. So we have that. That tells you can manufacture the product. It tells you the process is right and the facility is right. And now we have the results showing that the end product coming out of that process is at the appropriate level. And I think the one point that I want to make is uh, we have uh, three professors in this organization uh, coming from... Uh, no, you're not. <laughs> coming in from UQ and also from the University of Sydney. The people that we collaborate with are very high-level uh, organizations and they lend credibility. Mm. Uh, our close relationship with the University of Queensland and the Australian Institute of Biotechnology and Nanotechnology uh, uh, also lends further credibility to all the work that we're doing and all the data that we are, we are collecting right now, which, which will ultimately be presented to the TGA. Mm. Excellent. With, with that presentation in mind, uh, there's two things that spring up to my mind. One is you've come so far with the Kirby, with what they're putting out there. So the chance of failure um, at this point, as you've already said, is very minimalistic. And uh, the second point is uh, lodging those results. Uh, just those two points there to tidy up on the trials. And then we've got some other questions. Could you just cover those two off for us, please? 
Well, I, I, as you pointed out, I think everything that we are trying to do is to de-risk the final results of the second arm of the clinical trial. And there's, there's no question in my mind that these results and the first arm of the clinical trial would clearly point towards that. Uh, the second bit of this is to ensure that we're getting the right compilation of results that we can then submit to the TGA. Now, we do the, this in many ways, including a, a very open and direct dialogue with the TGA. Uh, our head of uh, uh, quality and regulatory is in constant touch with the TGA, uh, providing them with uh, answers to any questions that they ask and providing them with the results that we can actually give them at any point. We've also made sure that we talk to organizations like the of Light Blood, uh, and we've actually recently made a presentation to them. Uh, we will be talking to organizations like the NBA uh, in, in the near future. Uh, the approach we have as an organization is that of transparency. And to be quite honest with you, if you're going to put a drug into a human being, you've got to be able to tell the truth and tell the truth all times. And that's the end of the story. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, I guess we'll move on to some other questions now. Uh, we're obviously looking at IPOing on the ASX uh, next year. Uh, the timeline for that uh, we've discussed is around quarter three. Can you go over the milestones which Agros will go through uh, through IPO uh, from where we're currently sitting till then? Okay. Well, look, we have two milestones that we are working on right now, and they are 90-day milestones, so well and truly before we're talking about IPOing. The first of those is to undertake the first dosing using Cobamir, and the second one is to get government support, state government support for our one million litre facility. So both of those we expect to occur within the next 90 days, and I have no doubt we will achieve that. The next milestone that will happen post that will be an order from um, probably the MBA, but from a government to buy our Cobamu. And we expect that that may even come with a pre-order. So as has been done with a number of other monoclonals in the early days, but irrespective, we expect that to occur by Q2 of 23. So they're the three milestones, two of which will be within the next 90 days, and the last one, which will be in Q2 23. Okay, great. With this, uh, the third milestone of getting an order from the government, uh, I've noticed that we've been raising money to upgrade the current facility in Sydney. Uh, how is that upgrade going, and when do you think that will be in a position to go into production? We have a, a very clear timetable with the upgrade. The upgrade cannot take place until we finish the manufacturing for the current clinical trial. Uh, this, this uh, we expect completion of uh, that uh, by November, and then there will be the upgrade happening. The upgrade includes uh, things like structural changes within the facility. It also includes bringing in new uh, scaled up equipment. Some of that equipment has already been received. Some of them, like the new Hemofrac, which is a six cartridge Hemofrac, uh, it has, has been ordered and we expect delivery of that at the latter part of this, uh, this year. Uh, the whole project should be completed by the end of the first quarter of uh, 2023, and we should be up and running with uh, uh, production in uh, April of next year. What would be your biggest concerns right now? You know, it's a, it's a good question, and I'm not trying to avoid it. I really don't have any great concerns. Um, for us, this is about execution. From this point on, I'm not worried about the technology. I'm not worried about the clinical trial results. I'm not even worried about the, uh, the bringing in the new manufacturing equipment because all of that has been done somewhere else. So I don't see any major issues. The, I, I don't call it a concern. I call it a focus. Mm. And uh, the execution mm. is what is uh, necessary and what we have to focus on. Uh, we have mitigated the execution risk uh, in a number of ways. Uh, for example, 
relationships that we've had with suppliers. Uh, they are, these are large uh, suppliers. We're not just talking about uh, small supply companies. We're talking about large supply companies. So we do know that lead times are cut uh, in, in uh, negotiating with these, you know, where lead times because of the COVID environment can be a year. We cut that down to three months. So that's the one thing. Second thing is bringing in competent people within the organization in order for us to be able to hit the goals that we've all got in Absolutely. our vision. And I, yeah. and I think that that is, at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which organization you're talking about, without the people to make it happen, you're never going to make it happen. So we've done that very successfully. And, and, and currently, we're bringing in more people. Uh, I can tell you that uh, we've just completed the appointment of a chief engineer who comes from a, a very large organization with a, a tremendous experience so that they, he can actually work not only on the scale up here uh, in Sydney, but also in building the 1 million litre plant when we are ready to go with that. So that would be my answer to this. The, the, the concern is not a concern. It has to be a focus. Mm. I've got too many straps on my back with this, this <laughs> gentleman uh, for there to be any concerns at this stage. It is a, <laughs> it is, it is a question of execution. Mm. And I come and just get, go away from this uh, particular presentation by remembering three things, execution, execution, execution. Uh -huh. Good on you. Uh, talking about that million litre facility, we're looking for that state federal support. Uh, has there been any progress there? Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, I have to be careful what we say because we have two state governments who are both vying for this facility and um, both of them have been doing their due diligence. And, and what is interesting to me was that they both went out and spoke to the relevant authorities, the TGA, the NBA and a few others as well. And all of those groups have reported back to the both states that we're talking to about how they see us as a very important part of the future in this area. So it was a very positive response from those bodies. And I think that augurs well. Yeah, it does. Look, I, I, I think, it, uh, Sean, uh, we can say uh, with confidence at the moment that uh, we don't have uh, too many issues with uh, the progress of uh, this relationship with the state government. Uh, we hope that in the next few weeks we'll be able to uh, announce something positive. Uh, we can't shock change that because there are elements of government and confidentiality that we can't cross. Okay, excellent. You've uh, we've mentioned in the past you've been approached by the National Health Service. Uh, you were talking with uh, the Middle East. Uh, how has the progress been of your overseas uh, potential operations? Uh, and I mean, Southeast Asia, we could manufacture product there as well. But mm. uh, how are those overseas orders going mm. uh, at this stage? Okay, look, that's a very good question. Uh, first of all, dealing with NHS, um, we were selected to be one of five finalists to be shortlisted down to three. Um, we got through that process and they then said to us, okay, fantastic gentlemen, now you need to show us that you have the capacity to manufacture at the appropriate level today. And we said, well, yes, in two years' time we can do that. And they said, well, that's fine, but we need to commit now. Come back and talk to us in two years' time once you've got your process working and we will retender at that stage. So that's where we're at. We are in a position where they've reviewed it, they like what they saw, but we need to be able to produce. And we cannot produce until we have our million litre facility going in Q1 of 25. So it's sitting there, but we have to go back and reevaluate that. In terms of the uh, Middle East, that is sitting on the uh, Department of Health's desk and we are waiting. They keep telling us it'll be a week, but we are waiting for that final assent and at that stage, we can proceed to contracts. So You've also got the soccer, which you're uh, competing with at the I, moment. I, I am not saying anything about soccer or cricket or anything else for that matter. Well, all I can say, uh, Sean, I say, I, you're absolutely right about soccer in the Middle East. I think uh, globally, everybody's thinking about the World Cup. 
So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we are talking about a project in the Middle East that soccer would impact all the countries in the Middle East. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, have we got any orders that are not TGA reliant at the moment? Yeah, look, we get at least once a month, I get a new inquiry for, uh, for some different country to supply product. And we've just got to put that on hold because we can't supply until we have our 1 million litre facility. The facility, which is literally behind us here, is our hyperimmune. And so what we're focused on is for the next two years until we come live with our 1 million litre facility, everything, excuse me, that we generate in terms of sales will be the cop immune that we have here in our North Ride facility. In terms of that, I believe the orders from Australia are pretty much going to stretch us to the limit. We have definitely got interest in cop immune from other countries, but I've got to be careful that we keep the supply in line. And at that stage, once we know we can meet the demand in Australia, we will move to some of the overseas orders, which we can fill at any stage. There is just an excess demand. We, one of our values, and we, we work very strongly on our values so that we can actually share the culture of the company with the rest of the company, is deliverable. If you have got deliverables, you've got a delivery date, you've got to keep a delivery date. If you've got a delivery contract which says it's so many milligrams or, or kilograms of the product, you need to make sure that you are capable of doing that. And I think that uh, any negotiations that we have have actually centered around that. Right. And the reliability of a promise has got to be what uh, uh, develops this company into what we believe will be the next major fractionator in the world. Mm. But to put in, uh, to address that question from a different angle, the volume that we will be able to do straight out of the box once this equipment turns up is about 100,000 litres of product. That at full capacity, 24-7 running would generate roughly two, sorry, roughly $600 million worth of sales. And so that is a huge number, obviously, for this company. And if we can make most of that go into the Australian market, then that's fantastic. If we need to, there are a number of other countries that would be very happy to pick up on this product given the results that we're already showing. Sorry, John, did you say 600 million from the 100,000 litre facility yes. in revenue? Yes. So we're looking at the capacity here that we could generate sales of up to $600 million on 100,000 litre capacity. Um, and the gross margin on that is in excess of 60%. So it's highly profitable. That doesn't even include the million litres. That's fantastic. Oh. No, no, no. And we'll be looking at turning that on, say, after in the sometime in the second quarter next year. The million litre facility will come online in Q, uh, Q1 of 25, subject to getting the obviously the state government um, support in the this side of Christmas, which is what we're looking to do. Breakdown in this side of Christmas. Um, I was going to bring you up to a couple of other things. So, in terms of the spend, we're looking at our current burn rate is about one and a half million a year, uh, one and a half million a month, up from a million, and that's largely due to personnel. We now have 92, yeah. 92 personnel, up from around about the 50 when we were doing a million. The number of people we need just to get this process done is, uh, is quite high. Um, in addition to that, there is a $6 million R&D cash refund that we will be getting sometime in October, November, once we've lodged our R&D tax refund. So all up, we're looking at a $30 million capital raise that we need to do between now and Christmas, and that is to fund the operations through to the completion of the clinical trial and also about $15 million worth of new equipment to get to that 100,000 litre capacity by Q2 of 23. Fantastic. So that, that funding will be done in stages though. So yeah. at the moment, we're doing 10 million uh, at this particular point in time. And then the next stage will be done on successful completion of uh, first dosing of the clinical trial and then uh, government support. So we've got value increases along the way 
Well, I think so, that's another thing to mention there, Sean. The price will go up at each stage. And the reason for that is as we uh, further de-risk the process, we undertake the clinical trial, commis- commencement of the clinical trial, we get the state government support. As soon as you've got the state government support, you can then say with certainty that we will have that one million litre facility operational by Q1 of 25. And that just brings in that whole uh, disruption that we will cause into the existing marketplace. So each of those is incremental in terms of the value. And then we've got the IPO, obviously, um, Q3 of 23, and that will be a multi-billion dollar listing at that stage. Excellent. Thank you. So even with COVID uh, sort of transitioning out of the limelight, you still think there's that demand there from the governments? You know, I, 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 I've I got to be honest with you. Some people talk about COVID as just another flu. You look at the records right now, especially, and you talk to medical people, you're, you're looking at 3,000 deaths. How the hell can it be just the flu? Uh, and it's not transitioning out of the limelight. What we are, we are learning uh, how to uh, uh, do is to, to, to learn how to live with it. But this is a plague. It, it kills people. And uh, no, it's not going to go out. Uh, you, you're talking about 10% of the world's population who are immunocompromised. Uh, they do not have the ability to protect themselves, not only from COVID, but from any other uh, viruses. So having a hyperimmune like this is vital. I talk to immunologists uh, you know, uh, every day. And when you talk about this sort of thing, they go, my God, you know, at least somebody is working on this mm. so that my patients are actually protected. Mm. So to answer your question, no, uh, uh, we don't believe that this is going to go out of vogue, so to speak. You know, this is a drug that will be needed and the capacity to react. Now, one of the things that uh, 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 Agros can do that other companies cannot do is to actually manufacture a hyperimmune against anything that's out there. If uh, the TGA or, or, or the uh, NBA wanted us to manufacture a hyperimmune against uh, uh, monkeypox or Japanese encephalitis, we can actually do that. And the point that maybe may have been lost in translation is the Sydney facility is going to become a dedicated hyperimmune facility. Mm which means that we can produce any hyperimmune at any time. And unlike many other companies, we can give somebody a hyperimmune, provided we get the source material within a matter of four weeks, which is hitherto impossible with current technology. What about uh, long COVID? And and again, this this is the other aspect of it, because a number of people suffer from long COVID, and there is a a very high likelihood that a drug like uh, COVID may be the choice of uh, treatment for people like this. Okay, uh, that's excellent. I think I'll move to the end now. We've got uh, a couple more questions and that's to do with, uh, we'll go back to the Kirby Institute and what that's done for the company because clearly that was a value uptick when you've got that third party validation, uh, which I know we believe the TGA was there and that was the facility. Now you've got third party validation for Covimune which we didn't have before, um, which is sensational. Uh, there is a market for it, for what you're saying. Uh, do you think CSL, Griffles and the other, Takeda, the big fractionators are starting to get a little bit worried about you now? I mean, they would have been worried for a while, but now you've got this publication out there from the Kirby Institute. Do you think they're shaking in their boots? Um, I don't know, but you want to answer the Kirby yeah. back? Yeah, look, uh, the the Kirby uh, Institute has uh, been a partner in what we do for a very long while. Uh, The fact that we've been able to publish something uh, is is actually very important. I also want to mention that as far as the clinical trial is concerned, we've got uh, Royal North Shore Hospital uh, and the doctors there who have been playing a major role, University of New South Wales uh, uh, through Cientia, who is well, we know in it's clinical science. In the yeah. world, yeah. All, all these, uh, I, as I keep saying to you, <laughs> all these relationships have actually uh, only cemented the fact that what we're doing here is world-breaking uh, research and development. 
and that finally when the drug comes out is going to be something that's going to be very useful internationally and before my business partner talks about uh, fractionation companies quivering in their boots that's not what we are here for we, you know we we want to concentrate Sean I keep telling you we want to concentrate on making agros the best possible ever what how other companies view agros that's up to them but if you make the best available drug out of the best available technology, I'll leave it to uh, you and uh, the shareholders and uh, all the other fractionators to sit there and say, let's ignore these guys. Well, okay, and that comes back to, th there are two parts to your question, if I can break it apart. Um, the, the first part relates to competitive tension and what could happen there. Okay, so, and in answer to that, be it a fractionator, be it anyone, no one is going to be able to jump into this market space for two particular reasons. Firstly, they have to figure out how to do what we have done. That's not a trivial exercise. The fact that we've done it means that you can throw 100, 200, whatever number of PhDs or whatever else at that, and you can then Ultimately, over time, you know, I don't know, five years, 10 years, you'd be able to get your way through that. But once you've done that, so you've managed to replicate in some other way the technology, let's assume that could happen. The second part, which is where the biggest problem is for all the existing fractionators, is they have a process which has been grandfathered, which means that there is no specific approval for Alberman, IBIG, et cetera. They're all based on this one backbone of manufacturing from cone technology. So as soon as you change any component in that backbone, all of those products require re-approval. And that, for an existing fractionator, to go in there with five, 10 products to get them re-registered is a nightmare. And as the Bayer people said many years ago in 2003 in their report, it would be at least a five-year process to get through that. So to answer the, the question on the competition, you're talking about a minimum of a 10-year period before anyone will be able to actually get into the marketplace without our technology, without working with Agros. Okay, so let's just park that for a moment. The second part is what is going to happen when someone comes out with a process, as we have, which is roughly 25 cents in the dollar in comparison to every other provider in the marketplace who is selling a product at a dollar, has cost, sorry, is a dollar. That is a real dilemma. And yes, we are actively thinking about how we can work with and how we can turbocharge what is our steady state business model, which is get the hyperimmune and start manufacturing that product and sell it. Two years down the track, come out with your one million litre facility, which will be the Alvin IVIG and possibly other products as well, and go into the primary market. That is the business model, and that is then replicated overseas over time. The, the timing of that, obviously, will depend on the cash flow and all those sort of wonderful things to generate the second, third, and fourth plant. But at $400 million for each plant, even though we could pay for that via uh, project financing, it's going to take time. There is an alternative. And that is to say, let's partner with someone who is in this industry and brings not just money, but brings something else, i.e. access to plasma that would otherwise go some other place, access to markets through marketing arrangements, whatever else that we do not have today and would save us those um, abilities. That is an interesting route. And I think all we can really say at this stage is we intend to examine that and see what what comes up and that was the short answer that was the short. <laughs> <laughs> well it sounds like it's very exciting at the moment guys yeah. so uh this kirby institute was fantastic we've got a new raise which i've sent the term sheet out for you all uh to see uh there's a lot more information in the email body on what's actually the significance of the kirby institute but gentlemen thank you so much for your time today uh, I really appreciate it. And as always, you're very accessible. If there's any more questions, please give us a shout. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Sean. Sure. Thank you, Sean. Sure. Pleasure talking to you. Very much. Thank you. 
Hello, I'm Professor Harry Nair, co-founder of Agros, here to introduce the Australian-invented Hemofrag. Housed in our state-of-the-art 4,000 square metre plant in Sydney, we use the Hemofrag to make Cobimune, a hyperimmune against COVID-19. Research and development is key to our success creating a revolutionary four-step process with yields of 90% and product purity of 99%. Membrane technology is the heart of Hemofrag and we make our own right here on site. The Hemofrag lives in our TGA GMP approved clean rooms, making hyperimmunes from blood plasma. And we have our own extensive warehouse capacity. Agros is replicating our hemofrag all over the world as we aim to provide self-sufficiency in blood plasma medicines in line with the WHO mandate. We are Agros, patients first through innovation. Hello, my name is Dr. Hari Naya. I am the executive chair of Agros and co-founder of the company. I am a hematologist by training and I have a PhD in medicine and clinical science. Agros is Australia's second plasma fractionator and the technology we use, the Hemofrac, is what is going to turn the plasma fractionation industry on its head. Current plasma fractionation uses what is known as the cone onkley kleister nishman system, which is composed of a multitude of steps which take into account things like your pH, ionic strength, temperature, etc. The multitude of steps, which is very important, uh, create a situation where you can actually exaggerate losses so that the final product, in the case of immunoglobulin, only 50% is produced uh, and this is significant when we are talking about the use of these particular plasma products in industry. The Hemofrag system is a four-step system and is composed of one capture step. What it does is that it gives you very high yields and this we believe will take care of the shortage of immunoglobulins in our health system and most possibly in a global sense. Agros's Hemofrag system is an elect electrical environment system consisting of three membranes, one on the top, one in the middle, and one at the bottom. Protein molecules are then charged using a buffer, and in this particular instance, the positive uh, immunoglobulin molecules are then transferred across the middle membrane into the lower stream towards the negative uh, electrode. The Hemofrag system is a four-step process compared to the multitude of steps that's required for conventional code. Now, in spite of that, what you get is a very high yield, very high purity and low running costs with minimal uh, impact on the environment.